Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our self-press webinar on new probes and sensors in neurobiology. I am Mariela Zierlinger, Scientific Editor for Neuron. In this webinar, we will hear from three scientists who will discuss different techniques for viewing cells and recording neuronal activity with high precision. Their presentations will give us a flavor of how one can map cells and network activity at an unprecedented level of detail. Our first speaker will be Viviana Gradinaro from the California Institute of Technology. She will talk about tissue clearing and viral vectors. Viviana is one of the early developers and users of optogenetics and is now an assistant professor at Caltech, where her lab continues to work on tool development. Her talk will be followed by Adam Cohn, who is a professor of chemistry and chemical biology and physics at Harvard University. Adam's presentation will be about all optical electrophysiology, which allows for the exclusive use of optical methods for manipulating and recording neuronal activity. Our final speaker will be Yang Xia Kui, who is joining us from California as well. She is an assistant professor of chemistry at Stanford University and works on developing nanoscale methods to study electrophysiology and signal transduction. Her talk today will be about nanoelectrodes for improved electrophysiological recordings. Our three speakers have all won numerous awards and have been, have been at the forefront of technology development. We are truly honored to have such a talented group for this webinar. Before we get started with the talks, we have a few practical points. Each of our speakers will talk for approximately 15 minutes. Following the talks, we'll have a Q&A session that covers all three presentations. If you have a question for one of the speakers, just click on the question tab at the top of the display and type it in. You can enter a question at any time. There's no need to wait until the end. We will try our best to pass on as, uh, as many of your questions to the speakers as we can during the Q&A. We are grateful to our speakers for making time to join us today and to our sponsor, Cellular Dynamics, for supporting this webinar. And now I will transfer the mic to our first speaker, Viviana Gradinero. Um, Viviana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mariella, and thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in. As many groups in neuroscience, we are interested in understanding the neural correlates of behavior, and we use deep brain stimulation as our model. Because of the heterogeneity of the brain, of course, we need tools that can address the, the challenges that this um, organ possesses. And there are quite a few challenges. A main one is heterogeneity, but also the the large span that many circuits have throughout the brain. Behaviors are mediated by intermingled circuits that can span from small regions of the brain uh, to brain-wide. So the focus of this talk will be on some tools that we've been working on and continue to work to address these challenges. To highlight why this is important, I will uh, share with you a learning from the field of deep brain stimulation. A while back, we used optogenetics to try to understand how deep brain stimulation works. And one of the key results of that study back in 2009 was surprising in terms that it showed us that it's not only the cell bodies at the electrode side that are relevant for the therapeutic effects, but rather the axons either synapsing into the regions where the electrode is implanted or fibers of passage can also be recruited. And that causes some complications because some of the therapeutic effect could actually be implemented very, at very distant locations from the electrode side. So what you see here is a scan from a Parkinson patient, and STN is the favorite region, the subthalamic nucleus for deep brain stimulation to address tremors in such patients. And what you see, the bundles in yellow, are the result of um, mapping by diffusion tensor imaging. So what we observed here in collaboration with Dr. Jamie Henderson was that indeed there are many fibers that go through the STM. And all of these could be susceptible to electrical stimulation and more uh, basic neuroscience related to optogenetic modulations as well. So it's important when we perform both our experimental studies or um, clinical interventions to be aware of the extent of the circuits we are recruiting. So in this case, for, for example, for optogenetics, when you apply the excitation on the fi fibers or the terminals, there are a few interesting things that can happen. One of them is back propagation. 
So you can get backpropagating action potentials that go back to the cell bodies, the originating cell bodies, and then those cell bodies could further trigger activity in distant areas. So it is very important indeed to understand the full extent of the circuits we are dealing with. And this is a rather difficult problem in the mammalian tissue because as many of you are familiar, it's rather opaque, so we don't have optical access to the tissue or access for labeling molecules as well. So in this respect, the field of tissue clearing has been rather useful. And I should mention this is a century-old um, endeavor because of the importance of histology and because of the importance of understanding what we are, the tissue we are working on. Early on, organic sol solvents were very um, widely used and efficient because they can clear the tissue very fast with high efficiency. However, there are some downsides, such as bleaching of endogenous fluorescence. So the more recent iterations have focused on bypassing some of these problems. The goal was to obtain a transparent um, sample for investigation while still benefiting from the many developments that happened in the, in the field recently um, and over the, the few decades as well. So um, the key part is our ability to preserve endogenous fluorescence. We have many transgenic lines that have interesting pathways already labeled, and by clearing with organic solvents or strong solvents or detergents, you don't benefit from the um, expression of fluorescent proteins. So what you would like from a tissue clearing method is the ability to clear efficiently, to preserve endogenous fluorescence, to create space just enough so you can diffuse in labeling molecules, and ideally you would like to do that without having to wait for too long. And there is the caveat, when you use gentle solvents, uh, the waiting time is rather prohibitive. So what are a few approaches that one could take? The main culprit for tissue opacity um, is lipids, the presence of lipids, because light sca uh, lipids scatter light strongly, so you cannot see through very thick volumes of tissue. So what you observe here is a fixed mouse brain, um, untreated, and then after a few chemical transformations, you can indeed obtain a mass that's transparent and also permeable to molecules for labeling. And one way you can do this is by removing the lipids. However, if you just remove the lipids, there are some downsides to tissue structure, to preserving the tissue structure. So the approach that we've been taking and other groups have taken is to try to secure first the structure of the organ by a hydrogel mesh. So one approach is to link the amines on the proteins with paraformaldehyde, a common fixative in histology, and then this will react with acrylamide monomers. One could then apply cross-linkers so you can initiate a reaction that will form an acrylamide mesh. And this acrylamide mesh will anchor by the amine and paraformaldehyde reaction, will anchor the proteins. And this can be securely in place. And now, when you apply detergents such as SDS, which is a gentle detergent that's not going to quench endogenous fluorescence, the proteins are still in place and they can be later investigated either by the power of their endogenous fluorescence or by uh, staining long molecules. A few challenges are around the speed of such um, clearing. One could perform just passive clearing, but this can be slow, especially for large volumes. Another approach is to try to enhance clearing with an electrical field. Uh, care must be taken in terms of balancing the heating uh, chance when you place a sample in, in between uh, electrodes that can generate that current that can effectively move the micelles out of the tissue. One approach that we've been taken instead was to use the vasculature. So one could indeed perfuse all of the reagents needed for tissue clearing, and we perfuse the reagents based on clarity, but other uh, reagents work as well, such as cubic, and there was a report in cells last year that used the same route of vasculature to clear entire rodent bodies. So the approach is rather simple. One could base on the transcardial perfusion uh, procedure that many labs are employing. And what one can do is, rather than finishing the perfusion fast, to leave the subject there attached to the pump and then perfuse in the hydrogel monomers, 
the initiator to cross-link all of the proteins to the hydrogen mesh, then the first step would be to apply the detergent, such as LTS, to remove the lipids. And now there is an option of either extracting certain organs of interest and labeling them, or alternatively, one could pursue through the same route small molecules, small chemicals, or antibodies to label tissues of interest. So this approach works very well, and it can clear most central organs. I have to say, though, that the brain is still the most challenging to clear, maybe because of its shielding through the blood-brain barrier. So what you see here is an example of clearing of organs, and what's important to emphasize if you look at the top uh, row in B is that the clearing should not leave the organs completely transparent because then it might be over-clearing and losing key proteins. Instead, the tissue, the translucent tissue, could be placed in a media that matches the refractive index, and then that can give further optical um, access to the tissue without uh, an over-loss of proteins. So by using this method, you can retain uh, samples of interest, for example, I'm showing here images from a rodent that was injected systemically with an adeno-associated virus ca carrying a GFP label. And what you can observe is that you retain label in the nerves innervating the muscle or in the pancreatic islands. And of course, throughout the brain, so I'm going to show you examples from a transgenic animal here, the Thai one YFP that has labels throughout the brain, you can um, observe the entire brain at increasing levels of resolution and at the level of spines. So now if we go back to our initial challenge of trying to map axonal fibers, long-range projections throughout the brain, many times such fibers run in bundles that are densely packed, and labeling them densely with a single color, even when using tissue clearing still has some difficulties. It possesses some difficulties in, in terms of our ability to follow individual axons throughout such imaging volumes. So what we focused on to complement the method of tissue clearing was to generate better labels, labels that we could introduce brain-wide and highlight in a genetically encoded fashion pathways of interest, either by um, their genetic identity or connectivity identity or even functionality. So in this respect, we recruited the vasculature again as a way to deliver such labels. And we focused on engineering adeno-associated vectors because of their proven um, efficacy and also of the rather ubiquitous use in um, neuroscience now to deliver probes, to deliver either um, things such as opsins or sensors um, and fluorescent proteins. One challenge, though, is that when we do local delivery to the brain, the spread is rather limited and the uptake is not uniform. You would get many gene copies at the injection site and then the expression will slowly decrease at distant sites. So this is a problem that we try to bypass. And the approach we took was to engineer large library capsids um, being um, variants uh, reaching millions and millions of capsids that we could then inject in bulk and the approach we took was to inject it systemically in the vasculature and then go to the brain or regions of interest and extract that tissue and ask which of these capsids, which ones of these millions of capsids made it through the selection process and gave us a capsid that could carry the task at hand. In this endeavor, it turned out that tissue clearing, and especially well-bodied tissue clearing, was very important in our ability to quickly screen through these libraries and try to understand which capsids have enhanced transduction of the brain, but not enhanced or similar transduction of the other organs. So we used all-body tissue clearing and scanned through these libraries, and what we've observed, I'll show you here data from two capsids. AV9 was the backbone capsid that we based our libraries on, and then we made variants of AV9. So what you see here is that in the periphery, there were not very big differences between transduction properties of AV9 and variants. However, when we looked in the CNS, the central nervous system, which was the, the target organ of our uh, screening assay, 
we noticed very good transduction of the spinal cord, the retina, and most importantly, for, for our purposes, of the brain. So what you see here is the starting capsid, AV9. In the adult, transduces the brain with systemic injection poorly and mainly transduces astrocytes. By contrast, the result of the screen that we performed, the library engineering and the selection, was a vector that when injected systemically in the adult can transduce the entire brain and does this with very high efficiency. Because we did not select for specificity, this vector indeed transduces many different cell types. So we quantify the strength of this virus compared to AV9 for astrocytes, for neurons and oligodendrocytes, and you can see that the transduction efficiency is much higher for all of these different cell types. Within neuron classes, we stain and try to phenotype them, and indeed we can hit most major neuronal types, um, inhibitory or excitatory. A cell population that was not targeted efficiently is microglia, and they are notoriously difficult to target. Because the modification in this case was done to the capsid and not to the cargo, this capsid can be used to deliver multiple types of genes to the brain. So what you see here is a walkthrough uh, the cerebellum of a mouse that was injected systemically with packaged fluorescent proteins. And you can see that you get good labeling and color mixing in this case by this virus. And this is brain-wide. One challenge in terms of mapping with this approach, though, is the density of the cells. Because, as you can see, it's very hard to follow, even with the, the color uh, identity, it's hard to follow the, the axons. So some work that's ongoing now is around the efforts of trying to tighter down this virus while still maintaining a good color mixing. So you can see in the first panels that at high um, titer, you can get good infectivity in color mixing. However, at low titer, you, you do lose this color variation. So we are working towards um, labeling in a sparse fashion, in a genetically encoded fashion, circuits of interest. A few pending challenges in the field of mapping and tissue clearing are, of course, imaging. Light sheet microscopy uh, proves to be a, a good complement to tissue clearing. However, there are challenges around image um, analysis. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that the brain is a dynamic system, and what's very important about it is the activity codes. And the next two presentations are going to focus on that. I want to mention before I hand over, though, that from tissue clearing, there are ways to extract some functional information. And we've been working on this lately with a focus on transcriptomes. So when neurons have different levels of activity, those uh, different activities can be reflected in different levels of RNA. And we have been trying to bring RNA detection to clear tissue. And I will show you some um, unpublished data that we are excited about where we can detect through very thick cleared volumes, we can detect protein RNA at the same time. So what you will see, PAC stands for passive clarity. So this is a volume of clear tissue from a trigenic animal. In green is the protein and in red is the RNA. And you can see good colocalization between the red signal and the green signal throughout the full one millimeter sample. Our hope is to bring this to a level where we can multiplex signals and also do this in a quantitative way. In this sample, the protein was rather abundant, so you cannot see single transcripts. However, if we combine this uh, detection for many RNAs, we might run into space limitations in terms of quantification. And here is where a concept from tissue clearing and clarity comes in very handy. The hydrogel that's used, acrylamide-based, it's water-loving and it can swell easily. So what you see here is that there is the ability to increase the optical space in the cell body just by putting the clear sample um, in a um, protein SK and water-based solutions. And then the cell body can expand and provide further resolution to the sample. So if one is interested instead to quantify, if you look at panel C now, 
before in B, the protein was too dense and the transcripts were too dense for us to be able to see single dots. However, when sparser transcripts are targeted, you can start to be able to quantify them. So the combination of tissue clearing, acrylamide expansion, and light sheet microscopy could allow us to reveal transcriptomes of cells at the single cell level following um, optogenetic or chemogenetic interventions in animal models of disease. So with this, I'll close up and hand over to Adam. And by mentioning that optogenetics itself could also be used for sensing neuronal activity. And this is a lesser known property, but a very important one that Adam will elaborate on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Viviana. That was a great talk. Um, now we're going to move on to Adam Cohen's presentation. Adam, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm moving ahead to my slides. Um, thank you, and thanks to everybody on the line for joining. I'm going to talk today about my lab's efforts to um, visualize directly the electrical activity of neurons. Uh, this uh, cover slide shows a summary of the whole story. We've developed a fluorescent uh, indicator, which when expressed in a neuron, either in a live animal or in a neuron in culture, can convert the electrical activity in cells into flashes of fluorescence that we can see in a microscope. And this uh, addresses the challenge of how to uh, record these extremely fleeting and uh, dynamic events, which are the essence of neural activity. This is a picture which uh, gives a summary of uh, what we'd like to do. This is an artist's conception. We'd like to make neurons light up when they fire. The challenge is that um, the electrical activity in a neuron does not uh, naturally produce any optical signal which uh, one can readily detect, just as one can't see uh, the electrical signal in a telephone wire. The signals we're after are um, typically action potentials, which are about a tenth of a volt high and one one thousandth of a second long. And for decades, scientists have been trying to develop uh, some sort of molecular transducer which can convert these patterns of electrical activity into an optical signal. I'll tell you a story about my lab's efforts in that area. The story starts here. This is the Dead Sea between Israel and Jordan. There's a microorganism that lives in the water here that produces a transmembrane protein which it uses to convert sunlight into a uh, change in uh, membrane voltage. And uh, this protein works by acting as a light-driven proton pump. So it absorbs photons of sunlight, and it uses that energy to pump charge from inside the cell to outside the cell. A few years ago, uh, I had the thought that perhaps we could somehow run this protein in reverse. Instead of having light come in and a change in voltage come out, maybe we could use a change in the voltage in the cell to produce an optical signal that we could detect. We found a way to do this. It turns out that this protein is a little bit fluorescent, so it can be excited by red light, and it emits in the near infrared. But it's only fluorescent when there's a proton sitting on a particular functional group in the core of the protein. A change in membrane voltage can drive a proton onto that uh, functional group because the proton is charged and lead to a uh, fluorescence output. And so voltage tunes the acid-base equilibrium of this protein, which then regulates the fluorescence quantum yield. And this protein emits in the near-infrared part of the spectrum. The protein is very dim, but very photostable. And because it's excited by red light, it's, um, that, that's conducive to imaging in tissue uh, with low uh, background autofluorescence and low phototoxicity. Here's uh, an example of some data. This is a picture of a HEC cell, so a human tumor cell expressing this protein. We're illuminating it with red light, and we're um, varying the voltage in the cell by uh, stepping the voltage up and down with a patch pipette between plus and minus 100 millivolts. And I hope that the uh, people on the line can see the um, fluorescence going up and down as the voltage goes up and down. 
We then took this protein and expressed it in uh, rat hippocampal neurons. This is a neuron in culture. You can't see it in the picture, but there's a little patch pipette stuck in the back of the cell. And here we're triggering the cell to fire with uh, little pulses of current injected. This is a movie at 1,000 frames a second, which shows um, an action potential inside the cell. On the left is some quantification showing the um, fluorescence and, uh, in red and the voltage in blue as a function of time. And you can see the correspondence of these two signals. Now, in that movie, we were using an, electrical, an electrode to trigger the cell to fire. But that partially defeats the purpose of having this optical readout, because one still has to go through the labor of uh, finding the individual cell and poking it with the patch pipette. Now, the voltage indicator we developed is excited by red light, and it emits in the near infrared. And so that leaves the rest of the spectrum um, open for other uses. Uh, many people, Viviana uh, and others, have developed um, flore excuse me, have developed light-activated ion channels. These are proteins where you can shine light on them and trigger a neuron to fire. So we decided to co-express in the same cell a blue light-activated ion channel. We call this one Sheriff, and our red light-activated engineered voltage indicator, which we call Quasar Two. The idea is that we will then flash the cell with blue light. That will depolarize the cell and cause the neuron to fire. And then we'll see the firing as a um, uh, change in the red fluorescence. And so here's a cartoon of that process. And you can see this works in PowerPoint. And so that's very encouraging. Here's uh, some uh, real data. Each blue bar here represents a flash of blue light delivered to a neuron. The red is the fluorescence recording, and the black is the simultaneously acquired patch clamp recording. Uh, at the bottom is a close-up, and you can see the correspondence of the optical and electrical signals. But we don't need the um, patch pipette to take the data anymore. This provides a system for all optical electrophysiology, simultaneous optical stimulation and optical imaging. Now, a neat thing about um, using light to stimulate the cells is that, in principle, one can control when and where one delivers the light to stimulate cells in different patterns of space and time. We've developed some instrumentation which has a modified video projector in it, a, uh, which contains a digital micromirror array, which can be used to deliver the blue light that stimulates the cells in any pattern of space and time. This system has about a million pixels which tile the sample, each of which can be turned on and off um, arbitrarily and independently of the others. So it's as though we have a million stimulus points tiling the sample. We've developed uh, algorithms then for mapping how action potentials propagate through cells with very high time resolution. Here I'll show you an example. This is a neuron where we're optically stimulating just the center of the cell, the cell body, shown in blue. And then we're mapping the propagation of the action potential wavefront, in this case, at 100,000 frames per second, or 10 microseconds a frame. The raw data is acquired at a lower frame rate, and then we use computational techniques to um, infer the timing of the wavefront with higher um, precision. And so this technique really lets us look in detail at how signals propagate through a neuron. We're also interested in, develop, in looking at large circuits. And so we've developed instrumentation uh, to image a large field of view. This involves a microscope with a very big objective. It's about the size of a can of soda, uh, which can look at a field of view several millimeters on a side with high sensitivity. Using this instrument, we can look at large neural circuits. These are, again, uh, neurons in culture. Here, we're uh, looking at a field of view that's about a millimeter tall by three millimeters wide. And we're optically stimulating all of the cells. And you can see their complex uh, firing patterns. So now I'll uh, tell you a little bit about some applications of this technology. One area um, we're interested in is to apply this to human uh, neurons for understanding human diseases. The challenge here is that nobody uh, likes to give brain biopsies, and so we can't directly access uh, human neurons. 
I've been working with my colleague Kevin Egan in the stem cells department at Harvard on a workaround. Scientists have figured out over recent years that one can take some skin from anybody, bring these skin cells back through embryonic development to convert them into a stem cell-like state called an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then take those uh, stem cells forward down a different developmental pathway to turn them into, for instance, neurons, which, would, which one can then grow uh, in a dish and study. And those neurons are genetically identical to the neurons in the brain of the patient. So this gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, explore how a patient's genetic background affects the intrinsic functional properties of that patient's neurons. The challenge has been to measure the function of these neurons, and so we've been using these optical electrophysiology tools to uh, look at the cells and to look at the response to different drugs, which one might eventually want to try in the patient. As a test case, we've been doing this on um, ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it affects motor neurons and leads to uh, paralysis and ultimately death. Uh, there is no treatment for this disease. So in um, Kevin's lab, they uh, took uh, some skin cells from uh, patients who had this disease. These patients had a particular mutation in a single gene, which was causal for the disease. They then edited the genomes of, these, uh, of the induced pluripotent stem cells, which they derived from the skin, to correct the mutation. This way, they had two populations of cells that were genetically identical in every way except for the single mutation which caused the disease. They then differentiated those stem cells into motor neurons, and we optically characterized their firing properties. Here's a summary of what the data from that kind of experiment looks like. On the top is an example trace of an optical uh, measurement of a neuron where we're successively stimulating with greater and greater intensities of blue light as we move from left, left to right. We find all the action potentials. Here the data is arranged in a raster graph. So each row is one cell, and each spot is one spike from the cell. And these vertical bands correspond to uh, stimulus epochs. We did this on hundreds of cells with this uh, mutation, which causes the disease, and we compared it to hundreds of the genome-corrected controls. There are many ways to analyze these spiking patterns. A simple one is just to average the rows together to um, ask how does the average firing rate depend on stimulus strength in these two genotypes. On the bottom is um, that data showing in red the mutant cells and in black the controls. And the main point here is that one can see a difference in the firing patterns of the mutants and controls. This difference turns out to be informative about the mechanism of the disease and um, has suggested some uh, possible therapeutic candidates. Now I'll tell you about a different area of application, which is towards uh, work in uh, live animals. So far, all of the data I showed you was in um, cultured neurons. But often, um, we like to look in an animal to see how the um, activity of the neurons relates to um, the uh, behavior of the animal um, and um, uh, other aspects of its physiology. This is challenging um, because, as Viviana said, brains are uh, quite strongly scattering, and so it's quite hard to see in them. And in addition, in vivo, we have to worry about uh, motion and blood flow uh, challenges. Nonetheless, we've made some progress here. Um, we have developed a transgenic mouse, which has this um, optopatch construct in its genome under control of the Cree uh, recombinase. We've also uh, developed some viral vectors for expressing these constructs in vivo. Now I'll show you some images of, of brain slices taken from animals expressing these optopatch constructs. Here's an image from the dentate gyrus, where you can see um, the cells sparsely expressing this construct. Here's an image uh, from the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And here's an image of uh, a striatal uh, inhibitory neuron, again, showing expression. And from these images, you can see that the construct traffics quite well, and it really fills um, the uh, cell and all of its processes. So just very recently, we've uh, expressed these proteins in um, neurons in uh, live mice and looked in the olfactory bulb 
And um, here's what the raw images look like. Citrine is a fluorescent marker that we have attached to um, one of the genetic constructs. And then this is the fluorescence of our improved quasar uh, voltage indicator. And then if we look in the, um, at the time traces, we can resolve um, the firing of a neuron. Um, this is spontaneous activity inside of a live anesthetized mouse. Uh, and then we also, here's another neuron which is slightly out of focus, and so it uh, gives a noisier trace. And then in the background, we see breathing and heartbeat artifact because this is in a live animal. So this is still early days, but I think it gives optimism for the prospect of being able to um, record both spontaneous activity and to use these optical techniques to map circuit function in live animals. So um, before I end, I want to just say a note about where these tools come with, come from that we're working with. Uh, the voltage indicator comes from the Dead Sea. The channel adoption that we work with comes from a freshwater alga, which lives in a pond in the south of England. And then we also use proteins derived from corals and jellyfish. Uh, to fluorescently label these proteins. And it's just incredible to me that we can um, explore, uh, that, we, that we can take these genes which evolved under totally different functions and uh, stitch them together to come up with new kinds of uh, functional proteins. So um, I've, here's a picture of the Dead Sea. I've told you about these archaeodopsin based voltage indicators, about uh, this OptoPatch trick for optical stimulation and recording about some algorithms for mapping uh, action potential propagation with very high time resolution, and about some work um, in vivo. And now we're applying these tools everywhere we can find a membrane. So normally people think about electrophysiology in the context of neurons and cardiac cells, but it also um, is important in many other um, uh, kinds of cells where there is a uh, membrane. One can always have a membrane voltage. So uh, with that, I will... Um, flash a slide showing the, the people who did the work, and uh, turn it over to uh, Bian Chao. Thank you. That was very exciting. And now our final speaker, Bian Chao Kui, who will tell us about the use of nanotechnology for electrophysiology. Welcome, Bian Chao, and thanks again for being here. Uh, thank you. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, working in my lab. So we work at the nanotechnology and the biointerface. Particularly, we develop a nano electrode for improve the electrophysiology recording. Um, bioelectronics, you know, the application of bioelectronic devices to bio biological systems has been highly useful for both fundamental research and the clinical applications. For example, some of the applications of bioelectronics are already very widely in clinical applications, such as pacemaker, deep brain simulation, and the cochlear implant. Those are very widely used already. Some of the applications are still in research development, such as artificial vision and the brain-machine interface. For the bioelectronics, a uh, central challenge is to interface those inorganic electronic devices with cells which are very organic. And how we can use our external devices to measure or stimulate biological cells is uh, so-called ele electrophysiology. So currently, how do we measure cell activities, electrical activities? There are two type of uh, measurement. One is um, patch clamp or intracell recording. The other is using multi-electroarray or extracellular recording. For intracellular recording, a glass pipette manually approach to the cell membrane and break through the cell membrane. The glass pipette is fitted with an elect electrode, measuring electrode. Therefore, we are measuring the membrane difference between the electrode, which get connected to the cytosol, versus the reference electrode, which is outside the cell in the solution. For extra cell recording, on the other hand, the cells are going on top of the electrode. So we are measuring the potential difference between the electrode, measuring electrode, which is very close to the cell, versus the reference electrode, which is very far away from the cell. So those intracellular recording and extracellular recording has been around for a long time. So both of them have very complementary uh, capabilities. For intracellular recording, we record large signal, generally around 100 millivolt. 
we know exactly which cell record from. However, it has extremely low throughput. We're recording most of the time, one cell at a time, maybe a few cells a day. And the recording kills the cell after tens of minutes. On the other hand, extra cell recording is non-invasive. We can record the same cell for months of time. And another big advantage is you can record many cells at the same time, such as hundreds of cells at the same time. However, despite that, the multi-electro array system has been around for like 30 years. Very few neuroscience labs are actually using this technique. That's um, a key disadvantage of this technique. It has a very poor signal. We're talking about the 100 microvolt compared with the 100 millivolt for intracell recording. It also has a low spatial resolution. If you look at the shape of the recorded action potential, they look vastly different. For Cutting outside the action potential, if you use intracell recording, you record one single up, upward peak. On the other hand, if you use extracellular recording, you're recording a biphasic peak. So the peak goes up and then goes down, and they do not look like at all. The reason is the extracellular recording is the first derivative of the intracellular recording. So quite a few uh, labs and uh, are trying to combine these two techniques how we can achieve non-invasive long-term recording and a multiplex recording for intracellular recording. So when, when my lab started a few years ago, what we noticed is two beautiful work. One is the work from Peidong Yang's group at Berkeley. They show that you can cut your cells on those vertical nanoneedles, very sharp needles about 100 nanometer diameter. It looks very painful to the cell, however, what Peidong's group reported is that the cells can continue to survive on those vertical nanoneedles, and also they can divide. They can survive for a week. A few years later, Hong Kong Park group from Harvard showed that you can use those nanoneedles to deliver fluorescence molecule to the cell. So the hypothesis is when the needle gets very, very small, the needle can poke into the cell without killing the cell. So that gave us um, an idea. If we can use needles to record from the cells, then we can record intracellular action potential without killing the cell. So we first try to make a bed of needles, and then we grow cells on top of it. And this is an SEM image. Uh, what you can see is it's a cell spreading well on many nanoneedles. In this particular case, it's around 20 to 30 nanopillars. We, we call it nanopillars. You can see the cell spread very well, and this, on this particular case, the cell has been cultured for a few days. So we went out. So our, so the red arrows here are pointing at the uh, nanopillar locations. It looks like the cell are golfing the nanopillars. And this is our idea. If we can make a recording electrode in the shape of the nanoneedles, then we can culture cells on top of it. If they get into the inside of the cell, then we have a reference electrode outside. We can measure the action potential, intracellular action potential. So we, that's, this is our device. We made a device in Stanford Nano Fabrication Center. It's a hand of the student holding a circuit board. In the middle of the circuit board, there is a culture well. On, in the culture well is where we culture the neurons or cut them outside. Underneath the cells are those electrodes. To the left, you, show, you see an image of 64 electrodes and very small electrodes. On each of the electrodes, there are these vertical nanoneedles made of platinum. So the platinum needle are only, are only electrode uh, that's actually exposing to the solution. All the other areas of the substrate are insulated with silicon nitride and silicon dioxide so that the nanoneedle are only place that can detect um, cell action potentials. So then we culture a uh, cell on top of the nanoneedles. What you can see in the movie to the left is that we culture the cardiomyocyte on 25 nanoneedles. And uh, indeed, as we show and also show by many other labs, the nanoneedle does not uh, interfere 
with the physiology of the cells. For example, the cardiomyocytes are still beating rhythmically on the nanoneedles. And uh, to the right is the action potential we recorded from the nano uh, electrode. And so when we first get this um, data, it was very exciting and also very disappointing, very exciting in that we can actually record action potentials using the nano electrode, despite that it's very small. It's very disappointing is that if you look at the shape of the action potentials, it's extracellular instead of intracellular. The peak is biphasic, it's going up and going down, and it's very small amplitude, about 100 microvolts. And so we spent quite a, a tremendous amount of uh, effort. It turns out our initial hypothesis is wrong. So it turns out there is a membrane wrapping around the electrode. So the electrode would not directly access to the cytosol as we initially hypothesized. That was rather disappointing. However, we realized that those in electrodes are very sharp. They are in the diameter about uh, 100 to 200 nanometer. Instead of recording the action potential, we can also deliver electrical pulse through the nano electrode. And by delivering an electrical pulse, those sharp nano needles will create a very high um, electric um, field, very high uh, electric gradient, field gradient on the tip of the nano, uh, nano electrode. That electric gradient will poke holes on the membrane that's in very close distance with, on the nano electrode so-called electroporation. Electroporation has been widely used by cell biologists to deliver DNA to the cell. In our case, because the membrane is very close to the electrode and the electrode is very sharp, we do not need the hundreds of volts or thousands of kilovolt. Instead, we just need a couple volt to do the electroporation. After electroporation, we see a huge change before, this is um, from the left and right, and right image, um, plots are recorded by the same electrode on the same cell. Before electroporation, we see small signal and also um, biphasic, uh, biphasic shape. After electroporation, what we see is it becomes intracellular recording. It becomes, it's a monophysic only upward. A lot of details can be seen, such as changing the resting membrane potential, the over potential, the shape of the action potential. And uh, this is a huge advantage because our electroposition is very gentle, as I show late, later. And the fact that uh, we can switch the nano electrode from extracellular recording to the intracellular, intracellular recording is also a big advantage. However, we know that electroporation is not permanent. The pore on the membrane is not permanent. And this is exactly what we see. Cells do not like to have a pore on their cell membrane. They actively repair the pore. As a result, the data we recorded are not very constant um, amplitude. Instead, the amplitude decays over time in a few minutes. So in the beginning, we record a very large signal. After a few minutes, you know, the signal decays. And after about after 10 minutes, the cell repairs the membrane and the signal returns to the extracellular potential shape. However, it's good and bad. It's bad that we do not constantly record the same amplitude. It's good that the cell recovers and does not kill the cell like a patch clamp. So with a nano electrode uh, recording, we can achieve the initial goal we set. So on the left, we see that we can record many cells at the same time, all for intracellular recording. So the left graph shows the five cells record, intracellular recording simultaneously on the same culture. And on the right graph, we show the recording from the same cell over multiple days, inter, all intracellular recording. So what we see is from day one, day two, day three, day four, as the culture mature, the shape of the action potential changes significantly, and also their beating frequency and the beating interval. So this work was published a few years ago, and then we were looking at why our nanopeter have a better um, recording, both the sensitivity and the capability than the flat electrode. We have to realize that nanopillar have a very, it is a very small, smaller, um, much smaller surface area than the traditional large uh, flat electrode. 
but it records much better signal. One of the reason is its vertical shape. We have done the TM TM study to see the the gap junction between the cell membrane and the electrode are much narrow on the nano electrode compared with the flat electrode. So the interface is crucial in for us to get a really good performance for electrophysiology recording. And then we, we think if we can further improve the interface, how the cell membrane interacts with the electrode, that will allow us to further improve the performance. Instead of the nanopillar electrode, which is solid, vertical but solid, we made a nanotube electrode, which is the vertical but have a hollow center. And the diagram is drawn on the bottom of the, the um, on the bottom here. What is, you see is a cross section. It's a it's actually a cylinder. It has two side walls, has a hollow center. When the cells are growing on top of the nanotube electrode, the cell membrane not only wrap around the outside, but also growing into the tube. That is what is significantly changes the interaction between the cell membrane and the electrode. So we first we use scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope to show that indeed the membrane can grow into the center of the hollow tube. So the top images, what you see is we use the unroofed cell to look at the, how the bottom cell membrane intact with the nanotube. The white arrow, you can see that the nano electrode, the not the nano electrode, sorry, the cytoskeleton, cytoskeleton can actually go into the hollow center of the uh, nanotube. From the TM image, it's much more clear. On bottom of the TM image, there are four nanotubes. And one of it is enlarged. What you can see is the cell membrane not only wrap around the outside the nanotube, and also grown inside the nanotube. So using the nanotube recording, we did um, we did uh, very similar to the nano pillar recording. We cultured calcium outside. We noticed is there is a membrane wrapping around it. It is extracellular cell recording before electroporation. After briefly electroporation, it becomes intracellular recording. It achieves the similar advantages as the nano pillar electrode. First of all, it can do parallel intracellular recording. We can do about 60 to uh, time, uh, 60 cells at a time. Another advantage is the multiple day recording on the same cell. In this, in the right um, plot, we see the same cell intracell recording for eight consecutive days. Those are the same advantage as a nanopillar electrode and what is the difference. So we compare the difference between nanotube electrode and nanopillar electrode. The blue traces are the nanotube electrode recording. The red traces are the nanopillar electrode recording. As I show in the um, previous few slides, nanopillar electrode recording, the cell membrane receives pretty fast in a few minutes. And therefore, we, we see the decay of the um, amplitude pretty quickly. On the other hand, for nanotube electrode recording, we often see very constant, uh, very you know, constant amplitude of the action potential for the first, uh, um, you know, first few minutes. For one particular, few particular cases, actually, we see the recording, interesting recording for up to an hour. So nanotube electrode record about 10 times uh, longer intracellular access than nanopillar electrode. It also recorded twice a large amplitude. And of course, one of the key questions, why nanotube electrode get so much better performance than nanopillar electrode. If you look at the uh, diagram of the nanopillar electrode, there is a piece of membrane wrapping around the outside. There is a piece of membrane growing inside. Those two piece of membrane, pieces of membranes are opposite curvature. So the membrane wrapping around the outside, we call it negative curvature. The membrane growing inside the nanotube, we call it positive curvature. On those different uh, cases, Curvatures, they have very different protein composition. And uh, so we think if the nano uh, electroporation create a pulse on the positive curvature membrane, it will seal much slower than the pull down outside the membrane, which is negative curvature. So we did an experiment to prove this hypothesis. We have a glass pipette, and then we 
put the place a pipette just in contact with the cell membrane with no suction. Then this piece of membrane is rather flat. Then we apply the electroporation pulse and measure how long it takes for the pore to seal. Another case, we put a gentle um, pressure through the glass pipette. It will curve the um, it will curve the cell membrane with the suction force. In this case, we also apply the uh, electroporation to create a pores and then measure how long does it take for the cell pore to seal. Indeed, we found that the cell the membrane pore seal much slower when you apply suction compared with when there is no suction. And this proves that the positive membrane curvature is what is lead to the longer intercell recording. And so currently we are using this nano electrode devices to record from stem cell derived cardiomyocyte. We are also further optimizing the nano electrode geometry to further increase the performance of the nano electrode. So one of the questions we were repeatedly asked is exactly how large is the pore size through electroporation? If the electroporation creates a very large pore, it can easily kill the cell. So what we did is we found the cell that are um, sitting on top of the nanotube, and then we use patch clamp to patch on the same cell. So by using the um, constant current current patch, we can measure the membrane resistance before electroporation and also measure the membrane resistance after electroporation. Through the equations shown here, I will uh, skip the meaning. We can experimentally measure the size of the nanopore that we created through electroporation. So we measure the size to be around 8 nanometer uh, 10 seconds after electroporation. We have to notice that 8 nanometer is a very small pore. It's the size of a single protein, single, you know, membrane protein, as if we are plucking out one protein of the membrane, and that allows the electrode to get uh, electrically connected to the cytosome. So uh, that also explains why the nano electrode intercell recording is minimally invasive. With that, I would like to thank my group who actually did the work, particularly uh, two graduate students, Chong Xie and Carter Ling, who did most of the work, and also our collaborators and fundings. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. So now this brings us to the Q&A session. And let's get started with a couple um, technical questions for Viviana. So the first question um, is, is it possible to inject the AAV or the clearing agent into the CSF for better efficiency? Um, thank you for the great question. We actually injected in CSF for the clearing reagents, and we described this in the cell paper last year. And it works um, with good e efficiency for spinal cord and brain. There is one concern with over clearing of the cannula side. So we put a cannula, and there's over clearing of the cannula side and under clearing distal. But that's definitely a possibility. And for AV, we have not tried this route, but it's definitely a possibility. And one advantage would be less volume uh, to be used for the virus. Okay, and now that I have you for the whole brain viral delivery, how long do you have to wait until you get a good gene expression in the entire brain? So we looked as early as a day and as late as more than a year. At one day, we see some epithelial cells expressing. The quantifications that I showed you were a few weeks after delivery, about three weeks. We get very good brain transductions, potentially earlier as well. And in terms of long term, we've observed expression as far as a year into. Thank you. Um, a question for Adam. What type of hardware does one need if one were to try the, um, you know, the, this approach in the lab? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, I didn't uh, focus on the hardware requirements. Um, it depends uh, somewhat on uh, exactly what one wants to measure. Unfortunately, there are not any commercially available instruments that have uh, this capability, and so it always involves a bit of a construction project. For uh, imaging at um, high spatial resolution to look at single neurons in culture, uh, 
one can put a diode laser into um, into a microscope, a red a red diode, and then um, use a, you need a high numerical aperture objective and um, a good dichroic, and then a very fast and sensitive camera uh, to record these fleeting events. The image over a wider field of view requires this more customized um, ultra wide field objective to do optical patterning for patterned optical stimulation. One then needs to couple a digital micro mirror um, device into the microscope. Uh, rather than going through all of the technical uh, details of, of these instruments right now, um, I would direct the questioner to the uh, supplement of my lab's 2014 Nature Methods paper on all optical electrophysiology, where we describe in detail the technical um, requirements for these microscopes. Yes, thanks. And an interesting question also for you. Uh, so does the expression of the um, optopatch construct alter the endogenous function of the tissue or neuron? Great. So that's also a super important question. We're taking a gene from some Dead Sea microorganism, and we're expressing it in uh, rodent or human neurons, and so one might be concerned about what the effect of that is. This is, of course, a concern for any protein that one expresses in, um, in a neuron. We've um, gone to a lot of effort to do careful control measurements and calibrations to uh, compare electrophysiological properties of neurons expressing or not expressing these constructs. In terms of um, resting voltage, uh, membrane resistance, membrane capacitance, action potential initiation voltage, and action potential width, we do not see uh, significant changes between cells expressing and not expressing. That, for that to be true, requires expressing at the right level. If we overexpress the proteins, it is, of course, possible to damage and even to kill the cell. And so there's always a balance between expressing at a high enough level to get a good signal, but not so high as to um, induce toxicity. The transgenic animals that are expressing these proteins um, seem to be pretty much OK. Uh, they, they seem to lead uh, pretty much normal uh, lives. Thank you. And then a couple of uh, questions for Vian Chao. Uh, yeah. Can you mention or repeat the dimension and size of the nanotube and the nanopillars? And also, if you could um, explain the composition. OK. So the uh, nanopillar and the nanotube, we generally use a diameter about 200 to uh, actually 150 to 250 diameter, and the height is a one micrometer to two micrometer tall. For the composition, for the nanopillar electrode, we have tried two uh, different materials. One is platinum, and one is gold. They are all noble metals. For the nanotube electrode, we are using iridium oxide. Okay. Thank you. And we had a couple of um, translational questions, if you will. Um, you know, so I don't know if any any of you would like to um, elaborate or speculate how this, uh, you know, nanotechnology DBS or you know the op opto patch could change the way we treat um, either neurodegenerative disorders or epilepsy. Viviana, do you want to start? I could address the deep brain stimulation part. Deep brain stimulation is already successfully used for many indications, and I think there's potential to recruit it to even more. We are to understand more about the circuits that we need to modulate. So I would say that basic neuroscience approaches to map the circuits, both anatomically and functionally, could then be used to provide refined targets for the electrical deep brain stimulation that's already used in clinics. So it would be the same therapeutical approach, but on targets identified by these new methods that we talked about today. And this is Adam. Um, I think it's going to be quite a while before we are using this, this OptoPatch technique uh, directly in humans, uh, but uh, we have been using it in a diagnostic capacity. And by way of disclosure, this is work that's happening through my uh, startup company, Q-State Biosciences. Um, we have been taking uh, skin from patients who have genetically based epilepsies and um, making neurons from those patients optically characterizing those neurons and then looking at the response to um, a variety of uh, often already approved drugs. This addresses the challenge that often the um, treatment in epilepsy is uh, very empirical and uh, patients will go through a diagnostic odyssey where they're testing many different drugs before they find one uh, that might work. 
And the hope is that by uh, doing these tests in parallel um, on patient-derived neurons, we can try to find the correct uh, treatment for that particular patient. The same strategy can be used earlier in the pipeline, for instance, for segmenting patients for clinical trials, trying to figure out who is likely to be a responder ahead of time, and even earlier for mechanistic studies to try to identify uh, promising um, either targets in the cells or uh, to stratify among therapeutic uh, candidate molecules. Okay, thank you. I, uh, with that, I sorry. Would you like to add? Uh, I, I can add a few more uh, about the nanotechnology. So we we are actually using the electrode. So currently, the electrode has already been used in clinical applications, and some are in the development. And those are larger electrodes. But uh, we believe that we're currently working on is to um, actually fabricate the nano electrode on top of the bigger electrode to enhance the interaction between the cell and the and the electrode, which can be readily actually put into clinical application. Okay, great. So with that, I think we've come to the end of our session. I apologize, we've had a lot of other questions, and, but we don't have time uh, to address them. We'd like to say thanks again to our three speakers, Viviana Gradinaro, Adam Cohen, and Yang Xiaokui for their engaging presentations. We are very grateful to our sponsor, Cellular Dynamics, for the contributions that made this webinar possible. We'd also like to thank the audience for tuning in today to learn more about these tools and applications. If you missed anything during this webinar or would like to listen to it again, a recording will be, will be available shortly on the CellPress website. Please also visit the Neuron website at www.cell.com slash neuron to browse our collection, and in particular, our recent special issue on neuroengineering. The special issue contains reviews and perspectives on related technologies and is also freely available thanks to our sponsor.